千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I would like to extend a warm welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us. I want to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware as we all gather together in this sacred Tao process. So let's continue with the recap, starting with Lao Tzu, the instructions from Lao Tzu on the path, how to walk the path to attain oneness with everything. As I mentioned, it pivots around line nine, and therefore, the first part of it is all, everything from one to nine. And what we talked about previously was that we were able to analyze that section, the nine lines, and extract six principles out of that. We went through each one in detail last time. We ended up with the six principle, and the six principles were, number one, talk less to know more and be wiser. This is important because, as you recall, this is the line, this is the principle that had the most coverage from lines uh, one to three devoted to that. That's how important it is. Now, later on, we're also going to talk about the significance of the quietness that we're talking about. When you talk less, you wanted to know more. The idea is to listen with a humble attitude in the spirit of humility. And it turns out humility is the most important starting point in this entire thing. And it will manifest again in the six principles. The second principle is to shut the door on temptations and distractions. In the original text, the doors, uh, plural, describe the eyes and the ears. And this is because temptations and distractions are things that you may see with your eyes or hear with your ears. So to shut the door on that is not to blind yourself and to refuse to listen. It is to mentally be able to manage the incoming input. That which you identify as a distraction and temptation, mentally, you are able to shut the door on them. So shut the door is not closing the eyes, covering the ears. It means being aware and picking and choosing, be actively managing your sensory input. Number three, be gentle and harmonious in your interactions with other people. And you can see that number three also comes from the spirit of humility. When you are humble, you are able to act toward other people in a gentle and harmonious way. You will not be trying to criticize them with, uh, with a sharp criticism, critical remarks. Instead, you will take the soft approach, the light touch. That is very much in accordance with the Tao. Number four, resolve complexities by holding on to the Tao. So initially, when I studied this, I thought about this as discarding clutter, all kinds of clutter, physical clutter, mental clutter, emo emotional baggage, etc. As I became more advanced in my studies, I realized that there's more to it than just discarding clutter. It is also about resolving complexities in the confusion, disorientation of the mind by holding on to the oneness, the unity of the Tao. 
by holding on to the Tao itself, it is able to help you sift through complex thoughts, confusing thoughts, and help you hold on to what is real, what is important. So last time, when we talked about this, I used a, a story to illustrate the idea of holding on to the original purpose or the original intent. It has a powerful effect of cutting through complexities and contention. Number five, be naturally humble with everyone. So this is once again, the spirit of humility speaking to us. Here, the idea is to get along with everybody. Now, many people are naturally brilliant, but those who are egocentric as well as brilliant can let their mental brilliance blind other people. So Lao Tzu, what he says is that if you are already bright or you become bright through your studies, it is important to mute your glare so that you don't blind other people, make them uncomfortable with the glare of your light. Instead, the muted light, the soft light, is something that can illuminate yourself and all the people. It is something that is welcome by all. That's number five. Number six, the last one is to be, is to get involved. Get involved with life, other people, the community. You can get involved without being tainted by the material world. That was the idea expressed last time using the lotus flower as our example, as the metaphor for something that grows out of mud, but doesn't take on the mud in the pond, at the bottom of the pond. So this is a very common recurring theme, a common metaphor in Eastern thought, be the lotus flower. That is the significance. And we can summarize everything together like this, in this little table here, to the right of this, you will see the different tactics that people use to try to influence somebody. So the first one, the tactic of getting closer, that's to butter up. And sometimes we say to kiss up to someone. That is, hey, buddy, how you doing? You're looking great today. You know, the buddy, buddy tactic. So flattery, false compliments have no effect on those who have the attainment of mystic oneness. Why not? Well, it's because in the process of attaining that, someone who has attained that level doesn't have an ego that would find such an approach appealing. So they're immune to it. One cannot appeal to their ego. They're not egocentric. There's no ego that you can leverage to take advantage of. These are the people having attained mystic oneness. They prefer to deal with reality instead of a distort, distorted version thereof. And if you think about it, flattery, false compliments, those are all distorted versions of reality designed to make someone feel better, feel good about themselves. Praise, approval, validation, but ultimately just gratification for the ego. So then we also talked about the opposite tactic of getting closer, and that is becoming distant. In the six tactics that you see on the right-hand side, they are separated into three groups of yin and yang tactics. Therefore, the complement to getting closer to someone is the tactic of becoming distant. Therefore, the line following line 10, line 11 says, they cannot obtain this and be distant. To decrypt, what it says is that those who have attained mystic oneness, you cannot use the tactics of becoming distant to affect them, 
to influence them. So that makes it into our mini summary here as number two. Alienation, exclusion have no effect on them. This is the cold shoulder tactic. This is, hey, you don't belong, and then create an opening. Perhaps you can belong. So in order to belong, you have to do X, Y, Z. This is the exclusive membership tactic to keep someone distant and then create an opening. It doesn't work on those who have attained mystic oneness. Why not? Because they are secure. They are self-sufficient. They don't need to be included. They are often included by everyone who like their wisdom, the benefits of their thought process. Them having the Tao is reason enough to include them, but they don't need it. If they are included, that's great. If they're not, that's totally fine too. And therefore, the tactic of becoming distant from someone has no effect if that person has mystic oneness. And then the third one we talked about also, they cannot obtain this and be benefited. This benefit is referring to the tactic of appealing to greed. As I noted previously, it is one of the most common methods of influence. We see it in bribery. We see it in people given the opportunity to hoard goods and therefore becoming influenced by that, getting in line, waiting for hours. It doesn't work on those with mystic oneness. They are spiritually higher than can be affected by greed. So let's go ahead and put that in as number three in our little summary here, in our mini summary. They cannot be bought or compromised through greed. The reason why is because by the time they have attained mystic oneness, they know the Tao really well. They understand that they must be self-sufficient. They know they have enough. They understand contentment. Therefore, they don't need more. That's why benefit, graft, greed, bribery, they don't work on the people with mystic oneness. Now, one more thing that I'll, one more remark I'll make on this is that those who are highly attained in the Tao look after their material needs as well. This is completely contrary to the typical notion of Tao monks, Tao masters living with the bare necessities of life, living in poverty even. I want to let everybody know that in a genuine practice of the Tao, there is nothing at all against being able to live in comfort. In fact, to settle material world issues, to arrange things in a comfortable way is actually beneficial. It's actually something that helps in that you will allow the cultivator to concentrate and focus on spiritual matters without the struggle to survive. So following the Tao correctly means that someone who has attained mystic oneness lives life in comfort, in sufficiency, in contentment, in happiness. Let's move on. The fourth one was where we ended last time. It's about they cannot obtain this and be harmed. This is the yin and yang. This is the opposite to the appeal to greed. To benefit someone, the opposite to that is to threaten, to harm them. So this is the method threatening physical harm, some kind of harm. It's fear-based. This also doesn't work very well on people with mystic oneness and for specific reasons. Let's go ahead and put it into number four here 
as one of the things that we have discussed previously. So this is, uh, this is part of our recap as well. They cannot be scared or intimidated by threats. And this is due to a variety of reasons. They take precautions to protect themselves. That's true. But I want to explain that this really comes from the practice of spiritual and mental clarity. When you attain mystic oneness, you're able to see things much, much more clearly so that you understand what's going on and you can act accordingly. This includes being sensible in taking reasonable precautions because the world can be dangerous. It's not all fun and games all the time. So to be realistic and practical, Dow cultivators understand that. Number two, clarity letting you see possible threats from a mile away allows you to sidestep, navigate around, avoid those potential threats. There's no obligation for someone who's cultivating the Tao to intentionally put himself or herself in harm's way, in danger. Indeed, the world is full of toxic influence, violent people, it is beneficial to know where they are, where they may, may be coming from, and to make sure that you don't need to be too close to such negativity. So that's number four. And this is where we ended our discussion last time. As you can see from this slide, we got a couple more to go. Just as closer and distant are the two opposite tactics in the first group, benefits and harm, opposite tactics in the second group, we have the third group to cover, valued, degraded. So let me explain what they are. So that was a recap from before. Now we transition into line 14. Line 14 is close to the end. This chapter has 16 lines in total, so already the end of this chapter is in sight. That's line 16. Now, before we go further, I'd like to invite everyone to look at this slide, look at the Chinese text to the left-hand side, and I want to point out one thing. I want everyone to look at the last character in line 14, Gui. It is the same character as the last character in line 16. You can tell they are the same. They are the same, but they mean different things because each one is contextual. So in terms of translation, let me illustrate the difference. For this one, at the end of this line, it is valued and has a specific context, which I will explain. This is actually a negative connotation, so keep that in mind. The, the same character at the end of line 16 has a positive connotation. Therefore, instead of valued to be transla translated the same way as line 14, it's translated differently for line 16, honored. So let's delve into the first context, the negative connotation, and explore what that means. Remember, this is a tactic of influence, a tactic that those with mystic oneness are immune to, are not affected by. So what is the tactic of being valued? Well, in this context, it's the lure of position or prestige. So the idea is this, perhaps, perhaps the, the would-be influencer is approaching someone and that person has no greed that one is well-to-do, already affluent, and therefore greed doesn't work as an appeal. Well, the clever person trying to influence this target would then say that, well, everybody wants something, if they don't want additional monetary resources, material goods, then perhaps I can appeal to them in a different way. 
So the appeal is similar to greed in that it's what people want, what people usually want, except that in this case, it's about power rather than profits. No longer about money. It's about, it's about fame rather than fortune. So think about, think about what people say sometimes. Hey, listen, I can make you famous. That's a lure. That is a lure of becoming valued. It means you will be showered with attention. You will have a high profile. You'll be loved by the people. Wouldn't that be great? So think about that. It's a powerful lure for so many. So the method uses reputation, image, perception. Therefore, because these things are not necessarily the same, they're independent of monetary considerations. So it can work where money fails. Where bribery doesn't work, if the bribery is all hinged upon a value transaction in terms of money, if that doesn't work, then, hey, how about if I help you achieve a higher position? You know, not money anymore, but perhaps more appealing. So now you can see that this would also be something that won't work on those who possess mystic oneness. They're not affected by this because they have no craving for external approval. You know, what use is a high position for someone who has mystic oneness? They see that as being just as transient as material possessions. And it's true, high-level positions come and go. They're here, they're gone. The good opinion of people, transient, impermanent, comes and goes. One day it's here, next day it's gone. So they don't care about that. They're not affected by that. It doesn't, it doesn't influence them. They don't need to be showered with attention. This is related to them being so secure, they don't need some kind of validation by belonging to some kind of exclusive membership. It's similar to that. They don't need external attention, external approval. They're just fine on their own. We now have enough to add to the mini summary. So we're continuing the work from last time. Now we have a number five. They do not care for the promise of fame. Doesn't matter to them. They have no craving for attention. Now, keep in mind that before you attain this level, many people, perhaps even most people, do to some greater or lesser extent have that sort of craving. And these all become, these tactics all become weapons against most people because even with just the five, we haven't talked about the six yet. With the five items here, you can tell if one of these doesn't work, one of the other ones will for most people. It takes someone who's truly strong spiritually, strong, powerful spiritually to not be affected by any of these factors. So what about the six? Let's take a look at line 15. They cannot obtain this and be degraded. So to be degraded is the opposite of being valued. Now, now that you have seen the previous three examples, you can easily guess what this tactic is all about. The opposite method, instead of helping you build up your reputation, making you famous, is the threat of ruining your reputation, tearing you down, making you not famous, but infamous. See, with, uh, with the understanding, with the key to decrypt this entire section, something that is very difficult to understand for other people can become very easy and clear for us. That's the difference that 
accurate translation and interpretation makes. So let's talk about this. Think about the extreme form of this method, blackmail, extortion. Hey, listen, I'll tell everyone what you have done unless you do what I say, okay? Blackmail, extortion. Now, would this work on those who possess mystic oneness? Those who have undertaken the journey to eventually arrive at the realm of mystic oneness, they are also immune to this because in the process, in their quest to get to that level, they have decided to live their lives in accordance with the Tao. That is how you get to mystic oneness. You won't be able to get there unless you have lived in accordance with the Tao so much that it becomes a part of you and it's not possible for you to be anything other than congruent with the Tao. Therefore, it doesn't matter to them if someone was to come up with a blackmail threat or extortion because their conscience is clear. They can look themselves in the mirror. They know themselves they understand what they have done. They understand that they have walked the path with clear conscience and nothing else matters. Therefore, any attempt to blackmail them or to use extortion on them would really be just a slander and would be ineffective. That gives us everything we need for the six item here. They do not fear the threat of defamation to be degraded. Why? They know themselves. Knowing themselves is an important centerpiece in Tao cultivation. So now we have a picture of someone, a person, of rock solid integrity, someone who cannot be bought, not for sale, who not who cannot be forced, cannot be coerced, who cannot be bent against their will to do something against their ideal. You begin to get a sense for what it means to have mystic oneness. Do we have examples like that? Yes. We have examples like that throughout history. The greatest figures that we have from history possess mystic oneness. Now, they don't necessarily call it mystic oneness. They, it may just be character. They may say character matters. They may possess the strength, the great strength of integrity and character. They may not call it mystic oneness at all, but they are exactly as described by Lao Tzu in this chapter. Everything leading up to that attainment and the characteristics of having that attainment. And we can we can look at our the history of humanity. We can you know look to people, great figures, historical figures like Abraham Lincoln, Nelson Mandela inspirational figures from all over the world, east and west. That is what Lao Tzu has been talking about in this entire chapter. Such people can never be tempted, distracted, threatened, or forced to go against their ideals. So then it doesn't surprise anyone, I think, that these great figures would be the ones that are honored by the entire world. Not just the entire world, but subsequent generations who hold them up as great examples for everyone, past and present. And there you have it. That, in a nutshell, is mystic oneness. And I don't think we have ever explored the concept in this level of detail before. And I am very happy to have the opportunity of doing it.
our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us all travel safely so we can meet again. Until next time, may the Dell fill you with peace and happiness.